Or not, this year is just moving like a steam train. Isn't that right? What's happening yeah, with you, board or not? First of March. How? Oh, uh, Gareth, we can't hear you. What's wrong? What's wrong? Ah, uh, I didn't, I didn't hmm? hear you. Huh? I didn't hear you for huh? like yeah, a good second. Lost you there. Like, it was a... Unless you were like pioneering mining podcast. <laughs> yeah, man. No, 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 no. All right, we are live. All right, good morning, everybody. As I was saying, the month of March is like a steam train and it's going to roll ahead whether you like it or not. It's coming right at you. So, we got things to do, people to see, places to go on a Tuesday morning. Normally, We'd have uh, Le Bang here, but she is uh, not well. In fact, Simpiwe tells me that she is uh, highly, heavily, very uh, seriously drugged up this morning. So if we did have her on, it would be hilarious. <laughs> I don't she'd probably... think she'd be making sense. She'd just be like, no. yeah, gee. So how would that mm. be different from any other week? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she'd have the energy to, you know carry it off and be like, yeah, I see you, D. Yeah. But, but just a minute to Levan, like, we, she got two replacements. Me and some yeah, people. No. <laughs> yeah. So we, we really, we, we, we decided to go hard this morning with two replacements, so I'm not taking any chances. So we've got our intern Bagabantu Gaka here and he is, um, he's sitting in uh, one of the offices. We've got to turn that office into something because it used to be Sia's office, but we don't know what to do with it. It's got like a bunch of awards and books in it. And it can uh, be my office, Gareth. No, you should. Nah, you're still an intern. <laughs> can you imagine? Imagine he walks in oh, and gets whole... an office straight away. I mean, that would be ridiculous. A whole intern. Oh, my word. Oh, you're going to make mean... so many people upset. Like, not just you know, myself, but like everybody else in the office that's like, ha. Huh, an what? intern who's been here for two I minutes. What about it? We, we do. What we have an BE office. What about BE points, Gareth? What about BE uh, points? Uh, you think we care about that? <laughs> Listen, Bagabantu, let me tell you, you've got an office. You know when you come up the stairs and the toilet's on your left? Yeah. There's, that little, there's that table where we used to put the, 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 attendance, register. the attendance register for, the, for COVID? That table's that's your office right there at the top of the stairs. Uh, okay, okay, I accept that. Amazing, <laughs> fine. <laughs> At least you have uh, like a glass table. That's 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 a great way to start. Yeah. Hey? Glass table, got a great view. Like, yeah, yeah like it might as well be a kind of office. And also, if, <laughs> if, if if killers come up the stairs, you'll be the first one to encounter them. So that that works for all of us. Hey, some people. Yeah, I, I feel yeah. bad for the killers. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> hardcore closer, guys. Guys, I'm closer. Like the well, killer, the killer will come for me. This is not well. Sia playing around with the killer in the bathtub. Me, I'm from the mountain. <laughs> you say that now no. until you, you see that gun and you just like statue. You say that? Oh, no, yeah. bro. Like Josie. Yo, Josie. Will show everybody's, me everybody's brave until it happens and they run around like this, their hands over their heads, going, ah! That's what I think will happen. <laughs> That's like my biggest fear. Like, you know, like in movies, Gareth, like when like someone shoots someone, right? And they're running and then they carry on running. I always wonder, what would I do? Would I carry on running? Like, because it feels like a gunshot is pretty painful. Well, if it but it's if cool. it hit you, if it hit you, it wouldn't necessarily be your choice. It would be if it went through somewhere. If it went through somewhere important, you might not be able to carry on running, uh, Bhagavant. It's all up to the bullet and the gun and how good the aim of the person with it is. Uh, wait, like the other week, I heard like oh, not everyone can stop a bullet once. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Not like 50 okay. Cent, who, how many times did he get shot? Like 11 times Wasn't or something? Eight, nine, oh my gosh, that man. It was ridiculous. He was stabbed like no. 11 times yeah. and shot 36 times. Oh, oh my God. I saw this thing the other day. I don't know if this is true or not. We've got a lot to talk about, but let me just go on the sidetrack for a moment. Because, I mean, when I saw this, I wasn't sure what the hell I was watching. So apparently, DJ Khaled made some kind of comment about 50 Cent once. And... 50 Cent sent a video to him where he was in 
Khaled's mother's house. Yeah, and he's like, don't fuck with me kind of thing. He basically had, he's like, and, he, and he's rapping. He's, he's, it's, this, it's almost like a poem. And he goes, um, don't mess with me. A psychic told me where your mama lives. As you can see, I'm in her house. And there she is. She's asleep. And she's like, the mom is asleep there on like a sofa. And you just see her in the background. He must have sent the, the like, um, you know, more obvious version to, to DJ Khaled. And, and I mean, I have no reason to believe that these guys, when they're beefing, you know, a lot of it is for show. But I don't think with 50 Cent, I don't think he has anything to prove. I reckon he looks at the situation. He's like, I'll show you who you're messing with here, dude. I, and he's I like, know where your mom lives, literally. Yeah, exactly. And then he's like got photos of the, the house from the outside and the inside. Who the hell knows how he got in there? But the mom is like sleeping and she's none the wiser. And, and he's like, stop, stop talking smack about me or <laughs> there may be real world consequences. Now that is hardcore, you know? Like proper gangster rap. Guys, when, yeah. when rap was still gangster rap before it was yeah. poetry. And, and, and 50 doesn't just go, DJ Khaled, at the beginning of every song. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> <laughs> Another <laughs> one. Yeah, he's a real, you know, I don't know what you heard about me, but a bitch can't get a dollar out of me. Don't mess with that guy, right? He's just, he's a serious motherfucker. Yeah, anyway. Like, like, 50 Shins is from, like, the school of Tupac and Big. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah no, those, those, those are the real guys. You don't mess with him. Um, so... The funny thing about the 1st of March, and I never really think about it this way because I'm not an accountant, but it, it's year end, right? So yeah, for accountants financial. and auditors and those kind of people, it's like they pull out the champagne on the 1st of March. They're like, woo, we made it through the year. And we're all like, what the year? It's March. But that's how they think. I mean, like I even a friend of mine posted a picture of he's like, you know, you're an adult when you, cele when you celebrate financial year in <laughs> now that's boring right but um freedom fighter says many happy returns to sars <laughs> and yeah, i was gonna say like the tax man i feel like you're an adult when the tax man comes for you yeah, yeah. it's time to e-file that's when that's when stuff stuff gets real right uh some people are complaining simply with it they can't hear uh, us on the app so uh, you just it should be sorted now should be sorted, people. All right. Sorted. I guess. Stop yeah, complaining and just like, let's get it's on with it. I guess. Can you put it on you the want... WhatsApp group? If you have any complaints, <laughs> if you have any complaints about anything to do with the show, then please do do me a favor and just send an email to this address, uh, s i m p h i w e at cliffcentral dot com, and uh, you know, and it will be the... promptly taken care of. <laughs> well, well, well i hope so i mean i'm just guessing so you'll be taking care because <laughs> if you send me a complaint i'll find your mama's house and like send you footage like, i'll find your mama's house i know where you live <laughs> <laughs> all right so here we are on a tuesday we've got a lot of things to do this morning we've got this is us a little later on with uh, someone called brian green who's very cool and we try to introduce you to different people brian is a co-founder and creative inspiration between a bit behind rather uh, group 44 properties in Johannesburg. And they are trying to do what we would probably call urban renewal in the CBD. They're trying to reinvigorate South Africa and, and make it more exciting and make the cities a more exciting place because, you know, there are parts of Joburg that people just don't want to go to. And you know, property companies kind of gave up on Joburg for a while. And I met some of the, the people who are trying to re-energize the CBD. And it's a, it's a really interesting discussion. So we'll be talking to Brian Green a little bit later on. And you may even recognize the name from the Bang Bang Club, but I'll tell you more about that later on. Uh, that, of course, is that group of photographers who um, went into all those really dangerous areas and took pictures of stuff that the rest of us otherwise wouldn't have known about. You know, um, These are the brave guys who kind of pick up the camera and you see them running and some of them get their legs blown off and all kinds of things happen in these war zones because I, I was watching with this ukraine russia thing i was watching a little bit of all the news networks yesterday just going through the channels just to see what they're all up to and it's just amazing to me how you've got these journalists in their like 60s with their 
you know, their flak jackets on with like, you know, their bulletproof jackets. And, and I, I'm thinking, you're probably nowhere near the danger. I mean, when, since when did, I mean, if, if it were dangerous to be an international correspondent in a war zone, Christian Amanpour would have been killed long ago because she would have been like a prize for whoever could have, you know, Christian, guys, I got, I got Christian Amanpour. Yeah, yeah, you'd have it like stuffed and, and mounted on your wall. I mean, that's the fact that she's still alive means it's not always, you know, dangerous in a war zone for these journalists. And of course, there are journalists who've been in dangerous war zones, and there's some of them who are real and do their job properly, but there are a lot of them who are just posers. That's my opinion anyway. So. But do they have like some form of protection? Like when they are out there, is there like, do they have like an entourage of people making sure that right. when they are reporting, they're like, yeah, live from Russia, da, 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 that no one's coming in frame, no one's doing anything. Is it just all? You know, the funny thing is like we've, we've, the journalists are important and don't get me wrong, the free media is very important. We have, we have forgotten in this country what a free media looks and sounds like, because although we had one once, it appears to me that many of the media publications that people re refer to and, and rely on for their news these days are just, they're hacks. They basically get most of their news from Twitter anyway. And, you know, they, they, they're not brave people. Most of the journalists around now are just posers. They, they very often are university graduates who come from like middle class or even upper class families. And it's a way for them to kind of get a bit of shine. Um, it's not hard to be a journalist these days. You must just be willing to be paid absolute shit and work in a terrible environment, being the newsroom, with editors who very often have an agenda. And if you just do that, you can get ahead. You just tell the line. Yeah, you just tell the line. So there are still good journalists, but they are few and far between. And most of these people you see, they're, like, they, they're pretending to be journalists. They don't... I mean, there was a guy on Sky News yesterday. You know that... that that wall, that TV wall that they have where they have a map and then the guy's like showing you where the tanks are moving in and all. But this guy, he was like, he must have been high on something because he kept going, uh, 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 like his brain froze every time he looked at the fucking TV. I don't know if he couldn't see what we were seeing or whatever, but the guy was completely out of it. And I thought, this is your analyst? This is the guy you brought in as your analyst? I could probably find three people on Ravonia Road, who would do a better job than that, you know? And two of them would be hookers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like because they, they know everybody personally, they'll be able to say, yeah, Brian, yeah. I know Brian. Oh, he was oh, here like two hours ago. Especially with the Ukraine <laughs> and Russia story, they'd be like, oh, yes, we have come from the same village near Kiev. It's very good there. Uh, we've, we decided to come here rather to take off clothes for rich men in Johannesburg at the pole in the Grand. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, I don't know, like, like on what you're saying about protection, right? Uh, do you remember when uh, this South African reporter got robbed on live TV? Yes. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> of, of course, no, guys. When I ask these questions, I know the state of South A. I know that we don't have that. I'm just wondering, like, for international guys... Your... <laughs> yeah, Vuyo, yeah, I think his name was Vuyo. He was like, Vuyo, yeah. he's there reporting, and the guys are like, ah, Chief. <laughs> my God. Oh, oh, my. Oh, my. oh, my God. All right, anyway, let's but get you know on. The can I just say something? The benefit mm. of that is like when you get back to work, they're like, where's the equipment? And you're like, but they stole it. And you saw. Like, <laughs> you saw it on TV, yeah. No, but they but did, the, they, thing, the trick I is this if you were not watching SABC News, so. Did you see it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they stole the cameras, they stole the phones, they stole wallets, and I think they stole someone's watch. <laughs> they took all that equipment. But listen, SABC probably went, phew, that equipment's so old that we can get insurance to buy us new equipment. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, speaking of insurance, Jesus, did you guys see that fire at Greenhouse in Johannesburg on Saturday? No, what happened? No, no, what happened? Us. It was all over the... Come on, you didn't see it? No, weekends yeah. are for me being indoors. Uh, social media Nicole. is off. And I just chill with my friends I'm now and again. Loud. Like, So what happened? Update us, Gary. Okay, all right. So I, I wasn't there. I was at home. But I, I got started getting these pictures on my phone from people who were in Santon at Greenhouse, right? It's a famous restaurant now. It's been around and been around for a while. It was it was in Rosebank and they moved to Santon a little while ago. And um 
it's a it's a really lovely restaurant. They've got all this kind of all these kind of fake plants hanging from the roof, and they've that's beautiful. It's well decorated. It's got a magnificent bar. It make nice food, and it's the place in Santon that a lot of people were going out to for for you know drinks and to meet people. And post Corona, it was kind of nice for people to get out and do that kind of thing. Well, on Saturday night, uh, good luck were performing there, okay. and. Um, and they're terrific. I'm sure you've seen them perform a million times. You know, Jules, we've had them on the show. They're awesome people. And they had some pyrotechnics. They had these, uh, you know, these things with sparks that go up on the sides. You'll see it now in the video that I'm going to show you. And while they were doing this, the plants, the plastic plants caught fire. And then it spread like you cannot believe how quickly through the whole place and burnt the whole restaurant to the ground. Finished finished and i think it even oh like the damage to some places around it as well just watch this quickly you'll see what i mean so here they are here's here's gold yeah let me show you how it <laughs> yes that's, that's bad right and that I, fire spread really quickly. So it just shows you. You've got to be sure, extra careful. Yeah. I mean, wow. Hectic, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. I got a, so that I happened on Twitter. Like, there's no journalist in sight, but everyone is on Twitter or TikTok or whatever. Like, well, so you know, <laughs> citizen Don't you know the like, rule? Don't you? If, right. if you did not record it, it did not it happen. Did not that happen. is yeah. the fact. Yeah, yeah. You cannot be like, oh, guys, I saw a fire. And then right. you're like, where? Where's where? the video? Where? Didn't happen. Like yeah, no, like that's the modern day of if if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it. Did it really fall? Correct. But so then I mean, <laughs> so, you, know, you know, you know, you know what people like. So nobody was hurt. Apparently, everybody's okay, and they they you know they're now gonna obviously check it out with insurance, see whether or not they can get the place up and running again. But either way, uh, you know what people are like in this country. It doesn't take long for everybody to start um, making like. Um, you know, funny jokes. videos and all the rest, especially if no one got hurt, then people are happy to start yeah. joking straight away. So someone of course. took, uh, you know, that, that 80s song burning down the house. So they took that song and they're like, they made it look like um, good luck with their get, playing that song as it started. So watch, this is how the whole thing started, right? <laughs> Sorry. I would have gone with the roof. The roof. The, the, roof. the, roof. the roof is on fire. fire. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people, people are such assholes, right? Are such assholes. But what you know, I through my mind. My mind yeah. is that's a free. That's a free meal. I wish. I wish I was there then. Like you like, know, you, just you run away ordered with bottles girl. and bottles, and then woo, fire. Out. <laughs> right. uh, right. Bishang, Bishang says, I'm sure good luck we're playing taking it easy while the fire was burning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Talk about bad luck. Oh, like, uh, Congo Chris says, I think they took burn the bill a bit far. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my like, God. Anyway. I mean, like, if you were there, I'm sure you're thinking, I should have ordered that bottle. I should have, yeah, like, I should have just ordered that lobster. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because oh. yeah, yeah. you would have got away with it, right? You would have been like, yes. yeah, well, don't worry about the bill. We just got to clear out of here. Everybody evacuate. You're like, oh, but what about my... Don't worry about your bill. Don't worry about your bill. It's all sorted. Anyway. Oh, but Look, shame, man. It's that fine was, if, no, oh. if nobody's hurt. But obviously, you know, it's, it's scary. I mean, if you were, if you're there. And like, I'm sure there's a Karen somewhere in the group who's like traumatically hurt, Garrett. Oh, sure. Oh, my God. And I was breathing in the fumes and the, and the smoke was so bad. And I passed out outside. But luckily, I had my friends there and they looked after me. Like, they were there like if it wasn't for Cindy, I, d I don't know if I would have like made it out alive. Eh? She, she just she, she managed to just like take no. hold of the situation. Because I froze. I, I, I literally just froze. I've never seen like... <laughs> Fire like that in my lap. It, it was, yeah, guys. Oh, right in front I need a spa day for this like, now. And you think, and you think Russia's bad. Imagine, like I survived. I, I, bet, you, I bet you there's someone in. Yeah, 
I guarantee you there's someone who went like, oh, you know, Russia may be bad, but this was way worse. <laughs> they're like, Any... no, I don't know what they're going through, but oh my word, like I almost died. Oh, guys, I, I need a spa day. I just need the day off. My back is aching, you know, oh, like, oh. But you know, and then off they go. <laughs> this is also so, so obviously, you know, they're going to be looking into how it all started. And you could see in that video how it started with those, um, those, those pyrotechnics. I just, I have to ask because this is inside and you know, you've got these, these things on the roof and maybe someone could have thought maybe you shouldn't have such powerful fireworks on the inside. And I'm, I'm just saying, you know, yeah, like 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 the the analyst in me was like, uh, I think there's an argument for like arson there, hey, because plastic, plastic, everything, and then you guys yeah. have pyrotechnics. Where was the safety officer? Right, like like someone was sleeping safety. on the job. Oh please, what? safety officer. On the job. The... Somebody safety paid officer. him to just be like, dude, just approve this thing. Yeah, but, just to, but to like, look away and be like, officer, Gareth, you know how many safety officers we have because of this COVID thing? Like, I, I have there. no need. Uh, listen, let me tell you something. If someone is a safety officer, you should be ashamed. <laughs> if that's your job, you should be ashamed to be a safety officer. It's ridiculous. You're that's there like, to keep us all safe, like we're in kindergarten. Oh, yeah, safe. That word. Like, when in your, when in your whole life are you safe? I mean, you. you you know, if, if people haven't realized, like, I remember when 9-11 happened, I was like, well, clearly nobody in the world is safe because those people in New York think, oh, we're fine. We're going to work this morning. Out of nowhere, plane comes barreling into your building. That should have given everybody the idea there and then that there is no such thing as safe. Like the fact that humans are, the miracle is that you are alive and you are here. That is the miracle. The default should be non-existence, Right. So the fact that we're even here having this conversation this morning and everybody's joined us for this conversation today and that we're going to have some fun for the next two hours, that is the miracle, everybody. Let's not be greedy and go, well, we need safety. I mean, can you imagine safety? What would the, what would the, the safety officer do? Like put sanitizer on it and make it worse? He probably would have been like, I don't think that's a good idea. And then someone was like, eh, Joe. Just, How much I is it going try. to take for it to be I a good to, idea? I want every, <laughs> I, How many I want, every, I want every, every venue in, in South Africa to have a non-safety officer who walks around reminding you, you're not safe. You could die tomorrow. <laughs> you could be dead tomorrow. Enjoy yourself because you've got, yeah, who knows how long oh, you got Oh, left. no, no, Gareth. We have those. We have those in Joburg. They call them a par. <laughs> a par. Oh. I'm a par. I will make sure that you're not safe. They will no. remind you. They'll be like, oh, you have a nice phone there. Uh, no. can I it? those people no. will keep you on your toes i was listening no. to one of my friends talk about like taking uh taxis back in her days and she's like it was so bad that i even had to put my phone in my sock i was like yeah yeah that's yeah, when like, you that's knew when like you're on your you your toes like, <laughs> exactly. like the, best, the best ones gareth like the best ones are the ones that try to negotiate with you like the nice ones like the Dude, ones that don't come with the knife they're like that happened Dude, that happened to me you. Yeah, yeah, but that happened to me in Cape Town. There was a knife. And I mean, this was what, five years ago, maybe? And I remember I was, um, listen, it was four in the morning. I, I was, there was no way I was sober. So I, I had limited options. Let's just put it that way. And the guy was like, hey, you have, uh, you have a phone. I want the phone. I have a knife. You don't want the knife. <laughs> it's it's a negotiation. Yeah. Like, no. Like, yeah. dude, like, I don't want to. I don't want to stab you, but like, if you if you must. Yeah, I mean, so Michelle says she is a health and safety officer at the aquarium. Of course, that's not her full time job, but she's one of the appointed people that are in charge of health and safety there. Not for COVID, but for building and chemical safety. It's needed in real jobs. Look, I get that, and also Michelle, we don't want people jumping in the shark tank. You know, I get that. You need a you need a health and safety officer. <laughs> But I'm saying it like shark, when, when people sharks bite, yeah. Well done, uh, Bagabantu. You've obviously encountered one or two. That's very, that's very sharp of you. I run events, says Cheryl. One of the rules: no glitter candles or sparklers. And people look at us and say, "Why?" It takes seconds for something like that to happen. Sparklers set our fire alarm off. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, I'm still drinking the typhoid water. Look here, and Chris, oh, you haven't uh, died. I haven't died yet. And Chris wants to know if Carl has been drinking 
the typhoid <laughs> water because Carl says he's lying in bed with severe dribbly bum, could explode at any moment. Nobody is safe. Mm, <laughs> typhoid water. Well, I'd like to say everybody on the show today is drinking water. So keep hydrated, mm. kids. Drink your water. Yeah, you, you were drinking very fancy water out of a box the other day. Yes, Ooh. I was. You know, mm. just have to shake mm. things up now and again. Show you that I can also level up. <laughs> um, wow, but yeah, there's levels. You see, now I'm back to this. Like, uh, okay, <laughs> standard. <laughs> Uh, Yonda says, I can relate. I've been up since 3.30, got up to eat now. As drinking water has been making it worse. What is wrong with all these people who listen to us who have um, mm, diarrhea yes. by the sound of things? <laughs> I like that. Can we just ask the location of where you guys are situated? Because, yeah. you know, like we just need to make sure you guys yeah. even in within our because, vicinity. Because we want to be safe. We want to be safe. Yes. Yeah, we need we safety officer to look at that water, eh? No. So where's the safety? safety officer? Please inspect my water for me so I can drink it. All right, listen. It is your birthday month, Simpiwe. Yes, it is. Uh, and um, your list is almost ready of the things that you want from your friends. This is this is something that people were horrified with last week. But you know what? There were one or two people who said maybe a good idea. Then you get what you want. Now, Simpiwe obviously has very rich friends. And they buy each other expensive shit. Like, what did you get? An ice cream maker you mentioned last time? Yes, I did. I even have oh, a waffle how maker. Often use, how often do you use the waffle maker? I've used it twice so far. And then I've used the ice cream maker quite a few times. It's gone to a point where I'm like, I think I need a better one now. So, oh, <laughs> But I yeah, I've added when, some when items I, on my when list. I drive, when I drive past a, like a, a, you know, those rubbish dumps where people throw all their old shit and, you know, you've got those guys who go through it and then they try to find the cardboard and take that mm -hmm. into the recycling center and they get paid for it. Or they find electronics, for example, because you, you can always find a little bit of gold in all the electronics, you know, all the, all the circuit boards and all the rest. Those guys are like the scavengers of the, of the, the world. And thank God for them because they actually help us to get some of this stuff at least recycled. But I often look at those dumps and I'm like, who's throwing out fucking ice cream makers? And it's people like you, Simpiwe. It's you. <laughs> it's like you're like, you. I've got to upgrade my ice cream maker. So let me throw this old one out. And then it's standing outside their house on a whichever day the rubbish comes to collect. Yeah, it's not working the same way it was working. It's not as cold as before. I've had it for a few years now. You know, oh, just the right out of the old, in with the new. It's probably not the right color also, Simpiwe. Oh, it's wow. not a button. <laughs> No, it, it just takes too long. I can't wait 24 hours for ice cream. You know what I mean? Like, um, so now we need an ice cream maker that kind of makes it now now and we do the things. But I've added new things onto the list. Um, and I'm super excited because I'm just like, okay, guys, this is my birthday, man. I'm it's turning older. Yeah, so it's my birthday month and I'm I'm turning a bit She's older. hinting the whole time. I mean, so Cheryl <laughs> says it's her birthday, it's her birthday today. And she's sending you her list, Simpiwe. She no, tried your way. No one's taken the bait yet. No, no, no. No, that's not. You need to give people time. You can't tell me today is your birthday and then you want to give. No, no, no. The trick is you give people some, a couple of weeks in advance to figure out like, what do they want to get you or, before or the actual that. day. Or yeah. So that. like my list is going to be sent out very soon, like before the end of this week. And I can even tell you some of the items that are on there. So... <laughs> Oh, here One of the things I'd love to get, oh, I mean, money is always a great gift. You can never go oh, wrong sure. with money. Like, big... Money is amazing. Oh, please mention my favorite item. Please <laughs> mention my favorite item. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to get a, a new camera, um, a Canon uh -huh. G7X. That would be how much, great. How much but... those go for? How much are those in the shops? I mean, a G7X is not that bad. I think it's just under 15K, I think. Um Depending oh. if you get the vlogging kit with it, but that's not bad. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> well, who's, who's your, who's your, your dad, Bill Gates? No, no. Yes, yes. Uh, but that's not bad. Like I also like added books. There's a few books I'd like to get. I mean, I'm sure a book is not that expensive. Yeah, a book we could do. Yeah, yeah, all right. yeah. You see, um, there is a a vlogging kit that I'd like to get. That's also a couple of hundred rands. So yeah, mm -hmm. you see, the list is not that bad mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. 
Well, my favorite sure. item on the list, Gareth. Like, sorry to disturb you. She mentioned a full tank of petrol because petrol okay. is that expensive. <laughs> <laughs> a full you don't need tank to wait. Of no, That's don't hilarious. even wait for my birthday for that. Like, you can bless me with a full tank all day, every day. You can just even be like, here's a hundred grand, here's two hundred grand. Yeah, I'd never say no to petrol money. <laughs> never. <laughs> uh, Ethan says you're spoiled. Well, I'm like your tone. Relax. <laughs> relax. Congo Chris, Congo Chris says I'm starting to understand why Sim got kicked out of that party. Excuse me. Year. What do you mean? What do you what? Yeah. What, what do oh, you no, mean? People are, like people are, people are angry. Don't, don't be angry. I'm just <laughs> allowing right. you to be a great person in my life by getting me something Stink, I would Stink appreciate. Says, Stink Mina says you have an iPhone 13, but you want a new camera. You're delusional. Yeah, they do different things. One is a vlogging camera, and then the other is One a software. Is, uh, yes, the software is great, but you know, come on now, the guys. There's a difference. All right. Okay. Well, while Simpiwe tries to get stuff for free out of people that, uh, <laughs> that cannot afford <laughs> for this. Oh, well, while she's on this mission, let's look at some of the news coming in from all over the world. Uh, Apparently, there is now an Avicii museum. Remember, Avicii uh, died, I think, in the UAE, in, in Oman, I think it was. Not in the UAE, Oman. Anyway, uh, his real name was Tim Bergling. He grew up in Sweden and became one of the world's biggest dance stars. Uh, he was 28 when he took his own life in 2018. And the entrance to the new Avicii Experience Museum feels a bit like a club with a red carpet at the door, pink and green fluorescent lighting, and then there's concrete stairs that take you down into the basement where they have a whole bunch of exhibits. Um, and there's a reconstruction of his studio where he mixed all of his songs, including his hit Levels in 2011. You remember that song? As well as the mansion in LA where he used to play his grand piano overlooking the city's skyscrapers. In a replica of his teenage bedroom, you can see how he enjoyed playing World of Warcraft reading Harry Potter, and eating takeaway pizza. I mean, I don't know why you need a museum for this. Because to me, it sounds like pretty much anybody who was at the age of maybe 18 to 25 in 2011, that's pretty much anybody, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. like, I think, I think if, I, if you go to my bedroom back at home, I think you find the same stuff, except for the grand piano overlooking the LA sky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. You wouldn't see that in mine either. But Don't you're worry. on that level as well, hey? You're so yeah, like, I, I, I was mm. playing Minecraft back in the day, World of Warcraft. Oh. Yeah. yeah, like, that's not that's nothing special, but like, yeah, a beachy, yeah. So here's his what teenage is. bedroom, so you can get an idea. I mean, it's very, you know, you got to remember the guy is Swedish as well. So the Swedes, uh, they, they, they're very um, minimalistic. And he's, he's got a nice right. looking, he's got a nice looking bedroom here. Uh, his guitar Jeez, is nice. Yeah, it's not bad, right? Yeah, Quite so like there's a packed. Yo, but it's nice. So a of, there's yeah, a lot of stuff. And cluttered. No, there's a bunch of stuff there. Like, ah. Oh, well, that's why I'm saying. I thought, I thought the Swedes were minimalistic. That doesn't look very yeah, minimalistic. Like, like Mulella would be ashamed. He'd be like, oh, I have oh, a he'd be horrified. Friend. Horrified. But that doesn't stand. So that's anyway, uh, just in case you had nothing to do and you were uh, a massive fan of Avicii, then now you can go to a, a museum, believe it or not, where they have a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, great. So there's something you didn't know you needed to know this morning. Um, Julius Malema's firearm discharge trial has been postponed after the prosecutor resigned. This is, this is wild. So, is this, you remember, this is this the second time it gets postponed? I don't know, but do you remember when Julius fired that um, automatic rifle in the air at the EFF's fifth anniversary celebrations? I think it was in um, Danzan in 2018. Anyway, the firearm discharge trial has been postponed. Apparently, the state prosecutor resigned. Manema made a brief appearance with his co-accused Adrian Sneiman, who is a private security company owner. State advocate Joel Cesar, who has now taken over the case, asked for a postponement, saying he needed to go through the statements and consult with witnesses. Maloma is accused of firing an automatic rifle at the EFF's fifth anniversary celebrations. He's facing charges of illegal possession of firearms, contravention of the Firearm Control Act, and illegal possession of ammunition and reckless danger, reckless endangerment to persons or property. So um, we'll see what happens there. But, you know, I mean, if you ever needed proof that Julius is all bark and no bite, look at who he's on trial with here. I mean, 
the guy's name is Adrian Sneiman, and he runs a <laughs> private security. Julius isn't he doesn't care about the whole white black thing. He just he wanted to shoot a gun like he's a kid. He and and now, you know, he and the Boer who he's <laughs> I mean, who, was who buys kissing that boar and they were exactly. firing a gun together? Right. So who who buys this crap from him anymore? I mean, it's just ridiculous. But like, it was an open shut case. Like, it was at a stadium. Like, people saw right. it. There, there's like, footage. I don't think you need a prosecutor. Like, no, the guy's just... right there. Like, he did fire a gun. It was in a public crowd. That's endangerment. Listen, you can go. You can go to jail for that, hey. I mean, like yeah. for a long time. Um, I'm I'm a firearm owner, and there are very strict rules. So you got to know what you're doing. Exactly. So I'm um, trained. No license. Come on. The horror is saying uh, Ricky Rick is being uh, laid to rest today, and I saw a couple of tributes to him over the weekend. Uh, Congo Chris also saying uh, rest in peace, Ricky Rick. Yeah, man. I'm still. I'm still. Uh, that that whole story is just mm, I don't want to talk about it anymore and, and I don't think we're going to get any any answers, you never do when people take their own lives like this but yeah, it's just an awful answer, the guy who's dead, yeah. exactly okay. did you guys, so you guys clearly did not uh, see uh, the leaked letters that he left for his wife and kids and people were upset on social media that somebody A leaked those uh, letters and then, like, the contents of the letters was so emotional. He was just like, I love you guys. Keep loving each other. I just couldn't do this anymore. The pain was unbearable. Yeah, but can I tell you something? Oh. I also, I'm also, like, upset that people's private stuff gets published on, the, you know, on social media, on the internet. Like, is there nothing sacred anymore? I mean, the guy's dead because, largely, he was sick and tired of the nonsense you get on social media. I'm sure there was a part of it. You know, like, for example... Uh, who was the Pat, Patrick Shy? Who also yeah. he, he we know that that had a lot to do with what happened on social media the week before he died, right? Because people were just being douchebags, and and now we we want to share the most intimate m- notes that he left for his family. Like I want to know who who leaked that shit. It's just so tacky and revolting. It's nothing yeah, like, private anymore. It's nothing, nothing private. Is nothing is sacred, Garrett. Like we, I feel like. Once someone becomes like a public personality, we all feel entitled to their lives. That's what happened to Rick. Like we all felt like I have an opinion, like, oh, Garrett, I've seen him a few times. Oh, guess what? I think he's a racist and blah, blah, blah. And I can yeah. write that on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. And then no one cares about people's feelings anymore. But you know what's okay. sad is so people have been having like this campaign on Twitter. Hey, you need to be kinder and nicer. We're going to make this space really, really uh, wholesome and positive. And then there was a chick. um, She's like, I'm a piano um, artist. And she was just dancing. I think she was at Monte Monte Casino for the first time. And she was just dancing. She's excited. And were they not having her? They were so mean. And then people are like, oh, so is this what we're doing? We're going back to just being mean. We're going back to just kind of that negative space and then yeah, twitter people are like ah but we're just being honest what's wrong with us being honest and it's like that's the that's, issue right there uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people in the world who all they have is their twitter following and it's like you know 50 people or whatever that's all they have just think about how horrible your life might be if that's all you've got and if you have to climb into complete strangers because even if it's a celebrity it's a still complete stranger you've probably never met them the chances are that the reason that so many people are so angry is because their own life is just awful their their their, their, their life is full of pain and misery and rejection and 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 deprivation and all kinds of terrible things probably abuse and god alone knows what else and they, they kind of make it worse, but they don't think so because they, they're lashing out, right? They're lashing out and they, they're saying things about some girl who's partying at Monte Casino and they don't realize that it, it, it's more about them than it is about that person. Yeah, no, I agree with that sentiment. It's like, it's like the instant gratification that you get from that like is also the same kind of gratification you get from putting someone else down because mm. like, it's so easy, like being a keyboard warrior. Oh, yeah. And it seems to it seems to just 
bring out the very worst in people. I, I honestly, I'm not for banning anything because, you know, I'm a free speech guy. But I think in a country like ours, there is a very good argument for people to not have access to Twitter. Um, or maybe to have access to it, but not necessarily be able to have their own account. You know, there's just like they should basically go through Twitter. And if you've spent more than half the time you've been on Twitter just saying nasty things and being horrible, then you, you should have to apply in writing to, to rejoin. Because I, I think it's psychologically, it's really bad for us. And as a nation, it's done nothing to help us. If anything, it's made things worse because it, it creates bigger gaps between people. I mean, I just hope that, that with, with Ricky Rick, I just hope that none of it was directly attributed to anything that was going on in social media. But I'm not so sure that we can discount the fact that that was a big part of, of everything. I think social media makes a whole lot of people feel much, much worse about themselves. And we're only just scratching the surface on this one because we've got people in their 20s and younger who are growing up in a world where only social media, I mean, it's part of their lives from the moment they can... They can think. I'm telling you now, it's going to the, the cost of this, and we're starting to see it with suicides and all the rest of the cost of this is going to be enormous. We just haven't even we haven't even come to grips with it. This like, is I don't know, what, like some you know people's saying, real like, world is, like is the internet. online world. Uh, Gareth, you know that saying that the internet made the world smaller? Yeah. Like that's what social media does. Like people don't understand, like that community you get from social media is can also be a bad community. Oh, it's you can the like, worst, you, man. Yeah, you, you can have like a group of set of bullies who have like a direct line to anyone. Like I, as a nobody, can what post about Mini Zamini and like, oh, dude, like you look fat today. Mm. Yeah, right, you exactly. You have to work up to that. Like, no, no, it's horrible. All right, so uh, a couple other things in the news you need to know about. So Simpiwe is right to ask for petrol money for her birthday because high oil prices, according to... Um, the experts and the economists, motorists can expect another petrol price hike in April if this Russia-Ukraine conflict doesn't stabilize. On Wednesday, the price of both grades will raise will go up by one rand forty-six. Diesel goes up by one rand forty-four. Paraffin users will be hardest hit <laughs> as the wholesale wholesale price jumps by one rand twenty-one. The retail price will be up as much as one rand sixty-one. Um, diesel in Gauteng is currently at nineteen rand forty-eight a litre. And uh, there will be no usual levy increases, but the rising cost of Brent crude oil, which is up by 5% today, could push the fuel price higher even in April. So just warning you, you've got to know these things. People have got to know. And uh, don't say we didn't warn you. Um, this is interesting. The Guptas, you know, we, we, we don't hear much about them because they're living it up. They're having their the, the best, best time life. ever in, in Dubai, life. right? And they, they, they live in these uh, exclusive gated communities well. Apparently, Interpol has issued red notices for Atul and Rajesh Gupta, despite the brothers at the center of the alleged state capture project claiming that the NPA is uh, politically motivated to arrest them. Oh, you don't say, guys. <laughs> did, you, did you steal the money? Anyway, Interpol... <laughs> steal the political money? I think yeah. it, is it wasn't me. Rich. That's I bet I, I tell you that's the theme song. Every time they get caught, wasn't it me. wasn't me. Na 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 na. It wasn't me. Mm -hmm. They didn't steal no money. Well, here's the funny thing, right? Interpol has refused to grant red notices against their wives, Arti and Chitali. Now, I reckon if your husband is a crook, there is a, there's a good argument for us to take you in and just sit you down and question you until we can get your husband. Lawyers for the Guptas have confirmed that they had been made aware of the NPA temporarily succeeding in having red notices issued, but stated that they would be challenging these notices on the basis of material misrepresentation. Asked for a response to the issuing of the red notices, which have been the subject of months of legal wrangling between the Guptas and the state, outgoing investigating directorate head Hermione Crenier told News24, this is my last day at the ID, so getting formal notification has... Uh, been bittersweet, she said. It's paved the way for the Gupta brothers to be extradited. So many people have worked very hard to make this reality, uh, this a reality. And my sincere wish is that their efforts translate finally into those allegedly responsible being held to account. But now she's leaving. It's her last day on the job. So I hope there's someone else who could pick up where she left off, right? 
like what's the what's the best case scenario? We throw them in jail, we extradite them to South Africa, and then we throw them in jail. We, we get want, the money back. We want the money. That's what we yeah. want, Michael Bantu. We want the money. the money. Pay oh, back the money. All right. It's time for us to go to JJ Cornish. Yes, everybody. I know you've been waiting and everybody's been asking, where the hell's African analysis? Well, we're back on the go and we're back in the saddle. And to get us going this morning, none other than the great Jean-Jacques Cornish. JJ Cornish, how are you, sir? Bonjour. Did you want me to sing Gene Autry's Back in the Saddle or do I just go straight into ah, talking about it? I love it. So African Analysis is our chance to catch up on all the goings on on the continent. It is brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School. And we're going to, this year, get into lots of really, really interesting discussions. We're going to speak to people all over the place. And our man on the spot is JJ Cornish. So, JJ, first of all, um, welcome back and happy um, financial year end, is what we're telling people, on the 1st of March. But there's quite a lot to talk about when it comes to Africa. And we're, we're going to have to get straight into it. Um, let's look at the... The first big story, why are Africans being blocked from boarding trains and crossing the border out of Ukraine? There's a lot of talk of this. In fact, yesterday, I think it was of all people, Supra Mahuma Perlo, who wanted to know why our, our international relations department isn't doing enough to prevent racism in the middle of a conflict. But is there racism in the middle of a conflict? And what do we know for sure? Well, you know, if you were handling the file for Ukraine, I think you'd have to be very, very careful about the way you deal with the African students. And there are many of them there. They're coming from uh, South Africa, of course, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, Somalia, several mm. thousand Nigerian students. And that in itself would indicate that, you know, you, you've, you've, got, you've got something ticklish on your hands. Well, sure. uh, 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 first of all, there's uh, what 500,000, half a million people have left the country. And wow. uh, so there's a, a huge priority on trains. And one sees the footage of uh, fathers having to say goodbye to their children because uh, men between the ages of 60 and 18 are being held. They're, they're going to have to serve in the Perfect. military. Yeah. So they're sending their families away. But there is a sense, no doubt, in Ukraine about of, of resentment about the way that Africans and Indians have treated uh, this issue. India, for example, abstaining in the vote on the United Nations Security Council last week, abstaining along with China. In other words, effectively supporting the Russian position. Now, in Africa... Uh, South Africa, for example, as the maybe the giant on the continent, uh, has called for the withdrawal of uh, Russian forces and has called for uh, the restoration of diplomacy or the uh, beefing up of diplomacy. But they have not used the word condemn. They have not condemned yeah. it. In fact, In, uh, JJ, didn't um, our Minister of International Relations, Naledi Pandor, get into some trouble for saying we would like to... Um, to, to, to cease this uh, this conflict at the moment, and we'd, we'd love to see an end to it. She even went as far as saying, you know, the, the war must stop and Russia should w withdraw. And she got into huge trouble for that, didn't she? Yes, she did. You know, because on the, um, on the eve of the invasion, South Africa issued a statement saying it was concerned that, that diplomacy should prevail, diplomacy above all things, and that's what the United Nations Security Council is for, and it should deal with this. It was such a carefully worded, balanced statement that it made the statement by Prince Andrew look, you know, fairly one-sided. It was very, very cautious. <laughs> On the day itself, they did call for the Russians to withdraw, but they still haven't condemned it. Now, you know, for a country that relied on help from the Security Council in its days of liberation, uh, this, did, this didn't sit well with South Africa. And of course, I mean, South Africa, being a member of BRICS along with Russia, is being right. looked at very, very uh, uh, sensitively. I mean, so, South, uh, South Africa making that statement makes me think of like a couple who are having a huge fight in front of everybody. And then you stand off to the side and go, guys, guys, can't we just get along? It, it doesn't help. It, it's completely meaningless. But, um, but is there an issue with Ukrainians being so angry with Africans and Indians because they haven't supported uh, you know, their, their, their case against Russia that they're actually not allowing them to board trains? Is that actually happening? 
they, they are blocking them. They're, again, the social media to the rescue in this regard. They what they're seeing people do this. They're blocking them from boarding trains and they're blocking them from crossing the border. So they're keeping them there. Now, uh, the African Union has expressed concern. The African Union also, uh, Maki Sol, the Senegalese president, currently pres chairman of the African Union, uh, he made a statement, very strong statement against the invasion. And yesterday made a statement against what is being seen as racism uh, and, and against any action against the uh, mostly students, African students who are there. Very, very concerned to get out as one would expect them to be. Uh, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, 15-nation body, they have used the word condemn against the Russian invasion. I don't know if this will help. You know, I don't imagine you can get to the station and saying, well, I'm uh, Senegalese. I'm from ECOWAS. Uh, yeah. Maybe let me through and, and keep the Namibian and the well, South African behind. That's not going to work. But it's, it's a, it is it's a sad thing. And if this does count heavily against the Ukrainians, then, you know, they, they've shot themselves in the foot. And that's an expression we use in this part of the world rather freely because, uh, you know, we've had a tendency to do it uh, over the years. Oh. So, JJ, how about Russia? Are they, are they trying their best to show what good friends to Africa they are? Because they need support from wherever they can get it at the moment. Let's face it, the EU and much of the West are allied against Russia in this respect. So who are their, who are their friends? We know they've cozied up to China and China have said they're not going to stand in their way. But who else are their friends and are they looking for friends here on our continent? Very much so. Uh, and when you see people come into Africa, big term powers come into Africa, Turkey, for example, when they do it, it's, it's obviously uh, hoping for some kind of commodity trade and so on. But at the end of the day, it's votes at the United Nations. They want that big body, our 57 members. And if they can get that, and that's what Russia is looking for. You know, uh, interestingly, Russia uh, uh, has no way of... Uh, competing with China in terms of economic aid to Africa and whether it's economic aid or loans or very loans that turn out to be very expensive right. at the end yeah. of the day, we don't know. But they, they have come in with uh, uh, support, with uh, uh, intelligence, with uh, technological support, and their best friends are Libya, Mali, Sudan, <laughs> the Central African Republic, Mozambique, in all of those, they are very active on a on a quasi military level. We have Fosan Achange Tuadera, the Central African president, saying that uh, supporting Russia's recognizing Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, the two uh, rebel territories that uh, it used as a pretext yeah. for getting in. Because we, you know, we, we, we were waiting for him, like everyone in the world sitting on tenterhooks. Oh no, but wait, what did the Central African Republic have to say? Of course. Well, when the Central African Republic go to Washington and say, listen, pal, what about a few bob, you know, just to tide us over till the harvest? You, you know what sort of answer they're going to get. But the Russians, the most important thing about the Russians is they're putting in the Wagner Group mercenaries, Russian mercenaries into many of these conflict zones. And yeah. certainly the, the Wagner Group has replaced France in Mali. Uh, uh, militarily, uh, France, after nine years of fighting, they finally said, Sufis, that's it. We're out of here. Uh, these guys don't have, this is the military regime, of course, in Mali, uh, who were supposed to have elections last month, uh, but will now say we're, we're going to hang on for another five years. And again, have been sanctioned by ECOWAS for saying that. But uh, Emmanuel Macron said, OK, that's it. We're getting out of here. Uh, and what did Mali do with all the French going to lend French, Germans, Danes? He actually kicked the Danes out. <laughs> and then the Mali regime said to the French, listen, don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. Get out now. <laughs> so, you know, uh, very colorful things happening in Africa, which I think are going to have long term considerations. But China uh, uh, obviously remains Africa's best friend economically. Russia cannot match that, but is trying to be the best friend. But they've mm. made a little blops themselves, uh, Gareth, and that's a very interesting thing. They celebrated yesterday 30 years of uh, bilateral relations with South Africa. Well, mm. uh, one wonders why they did that, because, you know, that means if you count back that they actually signed the paper not with Nelson Mandela as they should have, but no. with F.W. de Klerk. 
The Russians <laughs> play the yeah. game the way they want to. And do you know that the ANC was in a stone huff with Russia for years afterwards? Russia didn't get invited here. The Russian ambassador was treated uh, indifferently here. And they all said, but why? And the answer was, well, listen, you decided to make friends with uh, apartheid South Africa. You didn't even wait that extra few months to make, you know, to tie the knot with us. And so now to go these all the years later and have this big celebration saying we're bells, we're back with South Africa, yeah. I think was a bit of a blops on their part. And I mean, we, we basically, we became a, a democratic nation oh. around about the same time that, uh, that Russia started to become Russia instead of the USSR. It all fell apart for, for the USSR around about the same time. So we should have quite a lot in common. And of course, the ANC would love to be cozier with, uh, with Russia. We know that our, our deputy president goes and visits there often. God alone knows why. Sometimes he says because he's sick, you know, but Didi Mabuza spent a lot of time in Moscow. So we should have better relations with them, but they've probably cocked that up too. Just one last thing before you go, and we've, we've got quite a lot to catch up on. So next week, uh, next time we have you on, we may, we may just start a bit earlier. But uh, Belgium's King Philippe uh, was meant to go and visit the Democratic Republic of Congo. Obviously, relations between Belgium and the Congo have uh, been very fractious uh, since... Uh, it's become common knowledge that what they did in the 1800s and, and the early 1900s there was absolutely revolting and genocidal. And they have, they have much to, to apologize for. And I'm sure that King Philippe, part of it was like a, please, please, please forgive us. We're so sorry to her. But he's canceled that too, right? He has because of the Ukraine crisis. I think I've used this line with you before. If you want to know what uh, colonialism did, read the book King Leopold's Ghost. You know, in South Africa, we make a bit of light of people still blaming apartheid for some of the ills. And, you know, how long are you going to keep blaming apartheid? Well, in this case, you know, I've visited the Congo many times and you see the parlous state of affairs there. When you read King Leopold's ghost, Leopold II, the Congo was literally handed to him personally. And he got yeah. 10 million people died in the Congo. Uh, in the Congo Free State, and he wanted, he, you know, he mutilated people, killed women, children to enforce the production of rubber quotas, cut the hands off rubber workers who did not deliver the quotas that they were designed to record. So um, he, you know, so effectively, King Philippe has expressed his deepest regret for the colonial cruelty, and he was due to go there. Uh, Belgium has, uh, but when the King Leopold's ghost first came out about 10, maybe a little bit more years ago, I remember going to the Belgian ambassador saying, I've just read this absolutely shocking book. Gareth, mm. he leaned into his jacket pocket, pulled out a piece of paper with a bunch of arguments that his government had sent him oh, about, you, you know, what to say ah. to try and explain what King Leopold had been up to. Happily, they've given that up now. Uh, so they have a, they have a very, very uh, shameful, shameful uh, colonial past, and particularly in the DRC, where I do believe the DRC still, to this day, 2022, pays for the, the sins of colonialism. You are not wrong on that uh, front, I'm afraid, and, and it continues to be something which should be a source of great shame for the people of Belgium. In fact, there are many European powers that got a lot to answer for during that time, but Belgium's be Belgium's charge sheet's probably the longest at this point. Anyway, JJ, it's always good to see you. And uh, thank you very much for coming on this morning. We've got lots of stuff we still want to talk to you about. And we will see you in a couple of weeks' time for the next episode of African Analysis. JJ Cornish. I very and, much look uh, forward to that. Thank you, sir. And the Johannesburg Business School making it all possible this morning. We will be back in just a moment. This is cliffcentral.com on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> never lost a battle. He was the hammer of the Christians against the Muslims. He needed to fund these battles. There was a good relationship between Charles and the church. He was very supportive. In those days, the church was very powerful. So you can only imagine how powerful Charles Martel was. particularly among the right wing, that Charles Martel's a hero. He's also got a brandy named after him.
Just because it's about technology, connecting your business to the rest of the world doesn't mean you need to send rockets to space and use complicated solutions. Want to simplicate things? Well, join Jakub Voigt, who is the CEO of Catalytic, on the Unbundled podcast. With skin in the game and a keen focus on educating and assisting you and your business, Yaku decodes all the aspects of connectivity, security, and cloud solutions. Unbundled is brought to you by Catalytic and is available on cliffcentral.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, all right, all right. It's good to have uh, JJ Cornish back on with the uh, Joburg Business School and African Analysis. And of course, you can catch that every, I think it's every second week or every third week we do it now. And um, you could be part of the show there where we look at African affairs, we pay attention to all the things that are going on in our continent, and we give special attention to the stories that don't always make the front page of the newspaper because, you know, we're talking Russia, Ukraine, we're talking about uh, American politics, we're talking about local South African politics, but there's a whole lot more that's going on on this continent that's worth looking at, worth paying attention to, worth referring to. And JJ Cornish is the best man with his finger on the pulse of what is going on. So we've got uh, Bakobantu and Simpiwe here with us today. Uh, and uh, Simpiwe is preparing for a birthday. But more important than that, her gran has uh, been on her case lately. And this is something that, uh, you know, old people have no shame about this stuff. You know, they're, they're the ones who always go at family uh, get togethers and whatever. Have you found yourself a partner yet? Have you found a girlfriend? Have you found a boyfriend? Why are you on your own? <laughs> And I know that this happens across the board. This proves to you that old people are the same, no matter where they come from, what language they speak, um, and, and what, their, what their own situation happens to be. Old people do not give a damn. If you're their grandchild or their great-grandchild, they involve themselves in your business straight away. They when do not... popping out those kids, some viewer. Yeah. They don't... <laughs> and they're they not getting right? any younger. <laughs> Like, just because I'm in a hurry and the grave is calling doesn't mean that you get to bugger around a whole lot more. Get on it. Where are my grandchildren? It's so weird because for the longest of time, I think in the black household, it's always like, don't date, don't mingle with boys, education, <laughs> get your suddenly, career. And then literally over. the next day, they're just like, yeah, so now when are you getting married? And when is this happening? And I'm like, whoa, 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 relax. And the older I get, the more like my grand, because my it started with my sister, right? She was getting all the, yeah, when are you getting married? When are you having yeah. a kid? And now she's done that. So the only other person to kind of attack is me now. And yes, oh, yeah, I'm getting the full brunt of it. Um, and I have a few guy friends and they'll come over to the house or pick me up and my grand will be like, is that, is that the one? Is, is, is that the boyfriend? Okay. No, I don't like him. I'm like, these are my friends. Oh. So like, when are you getting married, Zama? Like, I, I don't want to die without seeing you with a person. Up, huh? And I'm just like, yeah, this mm. is pressure that I don't think I'll be able Huge to live pressure. up to. And, you know, <laughs> she's, she says that she's worried about you. <clears throat> That's nonsense. <laughs> she is she's under time pressure. She's not getting any younger, and she wants to see the family expand during her lifetime. So she's not really. I mean, this is where these old people have got it. We see through you. We see through you, old people. 
We know what you're up to. We know what bullshit's I, going on here. We can read the tea leaves. You want great grandchildren and you want to see who we're going to get married to. And you're in a hurry. So now we must speed up our lives so that you can get what you want before you hop the perch. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. And I think in my case, I actually might disappoint her because I'm just like, Uh-oh. I'm not in a rush. And especially even if I did have a man, I'm like, I don't want to have kids. So I'm definitely the disappointment oh, in your life right now. Oh, bad and she's just like, the bad she's she's just, like just get a man. He's going to change everything. <laughs> Any man. Like you could, you could, you could end up with like Prince Andrew, who's like a child abuser. And she'd be like, oh, it's fine. Allegedly, Gareth. Allegedly. Uh, uh, please. <laughs> she settled yeah, for so, 10 million, but like, allegedly. You could, you could end up with, uh, a, a serial killer and she would be like eh, at least she got married and now i can mm-hmm. go to the grave knowing she'll be okay yeah. yes, yes if you that's can't... what she wants it's, it's, it's all about her and i'm like yeah because Granny, i also, love you but i'm gonna disappoint you no you have to remember, <laughs> in her day in her day there was no such thing as like an independent woman i mean she may have struggled and and i have no doubt that there are many older people in this country who have raised children and looked after the family and if it wasn't for those grandmothers we wouldn't have a society at all right we know what south africa is made of but in their day it was really important to have a man it was like part of what you you needed to tick that box you could you couldn't do things on your own you couldn't be alone um if you were you were like a failure there was something wrong with you Mm -hmm. so even if she was married there we go but even if you chose the wrong man you had to have a man yeah yeah but I, I don't know. Like, I'm just like, I'm sorry. Um, I think I definitely will be the one who's going to disappoint you. Uh, mm. My sister did a great job by getting a man and having a kid. Like, hold on to that. <laughs> don't well, look my way. Do not look my way because that's not going to happen. No. Well, Con- Congo Chris says, uh, Sim, maybe if you make a grandchild for Gogs, she will, be on, she will buy your birthday list for you. Maybe. Nah, I don't, it's too expensive. Then, the kid is then, too expensive. I, I yeah, think that's think a you, terrible trade. Yeah, <laughs> you think Simpiwe's list is expensive. Wait till you have to pay school fees. Uh, Cabela says, or you get married to another woman, then what? Because that happens. Well, I'm going to try to give my grand a heart attack. Like, I know yes, my grand. Yes. She wants a man. She would die if I came back and I was like, Granny! Granny! Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing you another girl. <laughs> she, <laughs> no. So she, <laughs> That because like be. now they try to be politically correct, so she'd be like, "Why oh, is that your good friend? Mm. You're a good friend." Mm. Oh, but She's like, always around, hey? You guys are very close. You're very, so, very close. <laughs> Corona's boring says, "What's next, SIM card? Your grand downloading Tinder on your phone? Well, imagine if, your, <laughs> imagine if your grand, like, if if she was really tech savvy and she grabbed your phone, downloaded Tinder for you, and started swiping on your behalf." <laughs> hey, I would not trust her with the selection. I think she'd just be like, because. For my yes, grand, what yes. she finds attractive is she looks what at the nose. Like? Oh. The nose. So she'll look at your nose and be like, oh, that's a good nose. He's good looking. I'm like, honey, no. You so what would, she think of, what would she think of Cyril Ramaphosa's nose? Because oh, he has... No, got, she said, she's... Every time we watch fam, what those family meetings... She likes like, him. Mm, more, hey? No. More, hey? <laughs> that nose. That's yeah, fun. Cyril's mm-hmm. nose. Yeah. Cyril's nose looks like someone threw a piece of plasticine at his face, and it just like kind of. She's, she's very hand. charmed by Cyril. She's just like, mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, good man. Yeah, he's he's a man, and I'm just like. I wonder how much of that has to do with his bank balance and the fact that he's president. <laughs> yeah. I think that helps. If you mm. are ever wondering where I get my, you know, tendencies of wanting someone rich, it definitely mm. comes from good my grand. Grade. <laughs> yeah she taught me everything well, and you, so yeah you know you know the uh, i know you're very close to your gran and we're obviously kidding here because you you know how to handle her and i'm i have no doubt that you've been having these conversations for, for a couple of maybe years up to now but you know what you say to old people when they walk up to your family things and they're like you're next at a at a, at a wedding or whatever you know what you say you wait for the no. funeral and you go, you're next. <laughs> that, that's the most quick. <laughs> they won't bother you again. <laughs> that is a show way to give that lady a heart attack. She'd be like, what? <laughs> God. <laughs> what, you, what, you lawyer. what is this? What is this? Witchcraft? And you know, black households still be like, Vanny, you wanted her dead. You, yeah. you wanted her dead. Why would you like say this? 10 years later, she dies. Yeah. Everyone remembers that one time some people said, 
I want you dead. <laughs> That'd be like, Valley, you didn't like your granny. You didn't like yeah. you. You are the well, one who actually asked killed you to make tea and you didn't do it. Yeah, it's your oh, fault. Oh man, it's it, yeah. everything is your fault. You are the culprit for every person dying in your family. I promise you that one day you didn't answer the phone call is the reason why they did. De- they did. Like I promise you, like people are something else. Ugh. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um yeah I, I i don't i just think it's really unfair of families uh to still be thinking that way and i mean i can't help it if you know if you're an old person and that's how you grew up that's what you think that's what you do that's uh that's the way you interact with other people and also the old people think that they have the right to interfere in everything i mean i often joke that I, all my grandparents are dead and they are that's not a joke. The thing I joke about is like, I'm glad they did me the favor because I know, I know a lot of people get, you know, they get on with their grandparents really well. And, and I loved my grandparents while they were alive, but there isn't like an amount of interference that old people do and get involved in, which is just annoying. And if you, if you have old people in your life, you probably know that better than me. I just think it's nice of them to have got out of the way in my family's case. I'm like, okay. Cheers, guys. It's very good. I will say staying with an older person, there's some benefits to it, guys. Like, I don't wait in lines. Like, this thing of waiting in line, like, I'm like, what do you mean? Like, if I ever, when I travel with my grand, we go straight. Oh, yeah, I'm with her. Like, I go straight to the front of the... <laughs> like, no, so it's more you, things I, like you that. Did, you, did, you did that last year with voting, didn't you? Of course. Mm. In fact, my grand is the one who taught me that. She, she was just like, hey, come here. We're going straight to the line. I don't know, waiting lines. And I was like, oh, this is nice. (laughs) This is so I was in and out five minutes, you know, you vote. And all you say is, I'm with her. No, we are traveling together. She can't wait. (laughs) So that is that is a big plus. Um, just quick reminder, um, Optimal Optimism is a new podcast series that we are doing. There's so many new series on cliffcentral.com. Just when you think that uh, you know what we're up to, we start bringing out new stories, new people, new subjects, all kinds of cool stuff is happening. And you've got to listen to optimal optimism. Here's the question. How do we listen to our bodies to create a life of full functionality on a day-to-day basis? What tools do we need to understand in order to have a 100% productive body? Well, this week in Optimal Optimism, Barrett Edelstein chats to Dr. Patukotle Zondi to find out about the various systems that make our bodies work. Optimal Optimism is made possible by Virgin Active, streaming live on cliffcentral.com, 11 a.m. today, or you can get the podcast wherever you listen. Very, very nice. Get yourself productive. Get yourself feeling good. Get yourself looking good. Get yourself everything working properly. That's what you need to have. Yeah. One term that I'm still not over is sleep hygiene. Um, I learned about it last year and I was like, what is this? And basically how everyone has a skincare routine. You're supposed to have like a, uh, a night routine. So every night before you go to bed, you're supposed to create something where maybe you'll be on your phone for like 10 minutes, read a book for mm-hmm. like another 10 minutes, uh, brush your teeth get into bed and then yeah. fall asleep. Yeah, so I that guess. is very important in order to function very well. And I didn't even know that that was a thing. It's called yeah, yeah. sleep I, hygiene. I don't do that, but <laughs> I don't <laughs> do that. Um, you know, you <laughs> just throw yourself on the bed, Gareth. Just throw yourself you on the think, bed and you've gone. You think, this is, you think this is bullshit. I could see your eyes rolling in your head when, when Simpy was no, saying. I have a friend hygiene. who goes on about the sleep hygiene thing and like how like, oh, my sleep hygiene has been thrown off for the week. So my month is ruined. I'm like, I might as well be talking about Mercury in record, retrograde and my star sign. Mm. It's all. Well, it's all, yeah, I guess there's something for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you? This is recommended by doctors. They just Listen. say that you should get into a pattern before you go to sleep in order to ensure that you get the best possible rest so that when you wake up the next morning, you're fully rested and you're able to tackle the day. So similar to a skin care routine, you need to... And they don't even say you have to do X, Y, Z. It's just figuring out what works for you, but then doing that every oh. night. Well, let me say That's this. The hard in, part. In, in defense of old people, because we've said some things about them now about how irritating they can be when it comes to like annoying you about stuff. But old people seem to figure this out 
you know, it, it, it takes old age or it takes age for people to be sensible about sleeping. Like when I was in my 20s, even my early 30s, I just didn't. If someone said, you need to get seven or eight hours of sleep night, I would have been like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't think I ever got more than six hours. And then sometimes if I was lucky, I would sleep late on a Sunday and kind of make up for those hours that I think I'd lost during the week. The reality is, though, I didn't care about it. I didn't take it seriously. And these days, quite apart from the fact that I've got older and now I'm starting to appreciate sleep a whole lot more. Man, I love sleep. Oh, it's the best. But, <laughs> it sounds so old. But, Man, no, I, I am old. It is the best. It's the best thing to sleep. And if you get a good night's sleep, you just feel a hundred times better the next day. That's a fact. But I didn't believe that. And you couldn't, you couldn't make me understand it when I was 20. Fact is, though, that there's also this sleep movement that's going on at the moment. And as much as I see your eyes rolling in your head, Bakabantu, the fact is, like there are a lot of people who've written books about this now. There are people who are sleep specialists. We've had some of them on the show. People who tell you how many hours you need, um, what kinds of things. As Simpi was saying, you shouldn't have the phone there with you while you're at, in bed at night. That shouldn't be the last thing you do. It is the last thing most of us do, right? Most of us, before we go to sleep, the last thing we do is just like check that we've caught up on all of our messages. We make sure that we've got our schedule for the next morning in our heads. Think about all the things that we have to do the next day. And you're on the phone the whole time, right? So I'm, I'm, not, I, against, I think, I'm not against like the science behind it, Jared. Like I get like that whole blue light affects us, like fluorescence and whatnot. So like getting those glasses that like tint your mm. eyes, even sitting that thing. I have that thing on my phone where like at 6, a, at 6 o'clock, it changes to like yellow light because that mm -hmm. helps you get into bed into faster there's also well, like then that you're doing more than me light. you're doing way more than me then you're a you're a believer <laughs> you're a true believer no no uh -huh. what i am against is this sleep hygiene that instagram is perpetuating like oh you need a routine it, it's it's just like that thing you guys were talking about friday like girl power you need more sleep you need this you need that there's certain things that like we all know what, what to do you don't need to tell me that's what i'm saying you don't need yeah. to tell me you don't need to make it a thing yeah, like, I think yeah. that's 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 a fair point. But yeah. I mean, if we don't if we don't talk about these things, some people are never going to figure it out. And there are lots of people who, you know, it's like the um, the whole Corona. And I don't want to go down that road, but the whole Corona <laughs> thing. Like if you if you didn't if you weren't at the front of the queue for the vaccines, then you must be an anti vaxxer And the same goes for the sleep stuff. Now there are people who are like sleep. What would you call them? They're sleep like the fanatics. Well, yeah, they're like sleep fanatics. And, and I mean, I got into a proper argument with someone once because they, they took the sleep thing so seriously that I just said, oh, well, you know, if you, if you don't sleep enough, you'll feel shit the next day, but you'll, you'll eventually come right. They were like, no, you don't understand. That is an anti-science thing that you've just said. And then like, they got very, very upset. No, I think that's ridiculous. But clearly, there's some people, this is their central, this is one of their core beliefs, you know, this is one of their, the things that they think is massively important. On that note, Gareth, but like the world is very bipolar currently. You either A or B, there's no gray area anymore. This is like, you either left or right. There's yeah. no like, ah, uh, can we talk about it? No. Yeah. No. Everything has have to, be... to be on board. Right. Binary. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Robin says, I don't even shower some days to bed with makeup and touch up in the morning. That's how important sleep is. Okay. All Why right. are you going to bed with your makeup? Forget the I, shower. I'm a guy and I know makeup and bed do not mix. Yeah, that is girl. No. Also, can it's I just horrible. say, like, uh, if you, <laughs> every time there's been a girl in my bed and she, and she's left makeup on my pillow. You must hear the swearing the next day from me when she's left. <laughs> Jesus. You girls, you, you girls don't understand. I mean, there are towels and sheets I've had to throw out, not because they were filthy or anything, but because they got like, uh, what's that eye stuff you guys put on? Mascara. 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 Oh, Jesus. That stuff doesn't come off towels. Have you noticed? <laughs> yeah, and it's black. <laughs> Shame, it's, man. It's, yes, it's so, really so if you, bad. If you have a white towel, and a girl has wiped her black mascara on a white towel. You throw that thing away. It's finished. It's gone. Forget about it. 
yeah i've got i'm super short so when i do wear makeup um even if i put setting spray which you guys wouldn't know what that is but that kind of that helps um make sure that the makeup does not get transferred anywhere else so if you had to touch your skin or fabric was on your face it doesn't get transferred i've stopped hugging my guy friends because what happens is you hug him your face is here he leaves some makeup or a lipstick thing and next minute they think he's cheating or was asking about <laughs> and he, he can't explain why there's makeup on his shoulder so i've stopped doing that and you need to just oh, get rid of it because your skin needs to breathe that's very yeah. Like that's the, the the only thing I have. Your skin needs to breathe, so wash it off. Yeah, I I don't buy this uh, setting spray shit that you just said because <laughs> I, I have or well, I had I used to have the towels to prove it. Now I, yeah. I, I almost think maybe you don't buy a good setting spray. That's the issue. There's levels maybe, to it. You need to maybe <laughs> I should. I mean, when maybe Gareth was buy... getting girls, like it was before setting sprays. Like uh, when yeah, last did thanks you? Very much. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell and you something. I'm gonna, get a set, I'm gonna get a set of black towels. That's what I'm gonna get. It's Be gonna be worse because then when there's that red lipstick, then it oh. pops out. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna win here because then but, there's blush uh, on the uh, black uh, towel. Yeah, oh man! Yeah, listen, you could wear all the setting spray, whatever that is, that you have and you could spray yourself like a layer of lacquer on your face like you'd put on furniture it's still gonna rub off on my pillowcases i'm not gonna be happy with that okay now you know what to do you must tell her to she need, first needs to wash her face before she gets into your bed no, no, guys, you must tell her about sleep hygiene that's what we must do like sleep hygiene Step well one. somebody said, somebody says here that uh, mascara yeah it's Vyasa, and he says mascara is like black shoe polish <laughs> it doesn't come off that's true Ugh. Tembisa so says makeup is disgusting. I stopped wearing it when I realized I couldn't cry at church and realized how toxic it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's makeup and there's makeup. I mean, like I'm sure you get expensive stuff and you get cheap stuff, and some of it's probably better for you than other stuff. But you I mean, like I couldn't imagine going to sleep because you we used to have to do uh, makeup for TV. You know, we went when I, I did a TV show, then they'd put makeup on me. I could not wait to get that stuff off. So I don't know how anybody can go to sleep with makeup on. It's uh, it, apart from the fact that it's bad for you, but it just it would drive me crazy. Plus, it makes your skin look terrible the next day, right? Yeah, and you just look like you have this hangover um, when you do sleep with makeup on, and you wake up the next day and you just look horrible. But I will say that I mean, you're a guy, Gareth, so you probably don't have like the right things to take off the makeup easily. Uh, most mm. chicks have like makeup m- remover things and so it's like literally you put that on it's 30 finished. seconds later and then you wash your face it's gone like, you know what like, i mean like, <laughs> turp and turp. Turp. <laughs> you see that's the issue right there so i mean but makeup is i love makeup but i'm also like yo shout out to people that wear it every day like, like oh. in defense of makeup have you seen like how like those the hits that like those youtube people get for like like what contouring and all these things sure like, you're like it's it's an art it is an art like it, i've seen some interesting tiktoks um at the beginning of lockdown they did like 30 days or 21 days of makeup looks and what they would do is these girls would literally it's a minute of them just kind of showing you foundation and that's then what do- they meant that's what they meant with flatten the curve <laughs> <laughs> i think it was about corona but it was actually about flattening the contours that's what yeah. it was Oh, now I understand. I was thought when Cyril was saying two weeks to flatten the curve. I thought he <laughs> meanwhile the m- motherfucker's talking about like getting your makeup right. Oh. <laughs> All right, now I get it. Uh, it makes sense because I certainly didn't think it took two weeks to do anything. Yeah, oh, but okay, I'm just this saying a breakthrough. There's a big breakthrough. People, girls out there. In fact, even some of the guys that I've seen makeup, they're able to transform themselves. You know, they'll mm-hmm. have, if, if if it's my face and then the, they're looking like a whole Barbie doll in like 30 seconds and they've you just know what I do. put on the things and it's uh, like, sometimes it's when you're amazing. Scrolling, sometimes when you're scrolling through Instagram, then you'll you'll come up to one of these things because they, they're often in the ads as well. They, 
So what I'll do is I'll skip right to the end and I'll see whether or not it's worth watching this person go through all of that stuff. Cause I don't want to actually see the process. I just want to see the result. And then if the result is really impressive and they look nothing like they did at the beginning, then I'll go, Hmm, let's see what they did there. But I'm normally also very skeptical. So I always think they just put a different person there. I don't think it's the same. <laughs> Sometimes they take these really ugly, haggard, terrible looking old like crones. And then they, sp- there was a granny. Have you seen? Have you seen? There was a granny who did this a while ago, and it was frightening, man. They put this granny on, and like by the end of it, she looks like she's twenty-two. I mean, obviously, she's put all the makeup in the world on, and she's like got colored contact lenses in, and she's had her hair did and everything else, but she doesn't look anything like it at the end. Now, I think, I think that's misrepresentation. I think you can sue for false advertising. <laughs> That's the beauty of makeup. You can transform into something, Mm -hmm. someone else. Um, Misrepresentation. Yeah, see, yo, it's hectic. Transforming into someone else and be like a misrepresentation. Like if I pick up a girl at a club, right? Mm -hmm. And like she's wearing all the makeup. It's dark, there's lights, there's booze flowing. Mm -hmm. And then I come home and then like like she does her skin hygiene thing, whatnot. (laughs) Can I I call her out on it? Can I be like, ah, dude, you're not the person I met yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Like she takes well, off her wig. Ah, girl. I mean, Vyasin says them, you can meet the love of your life the night before, and in the morning she's a whole new person. Whole new person, exactly. Yeah. Right. And and Justin says much more unkindly: you go to bed with peaches and cream, you wake up with prunes and custard. <laughs> 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 oh, that's horrible. Oh my god. <clears throat> All right, so we got to move on. I'm sorry. I'd love to get into more of this, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? There's plenty of YouTube videos for you to watch. So uh, we're, we're going to leave it there for the moment. It's time for This Is Us. Brand new episode of This Is Us this morning. And another edition where we uh, share a mutual concern for finding new ways to solve South Africa's problems through new ideas, new alliances. You want to overcome the myriad of obstacles that faces us here in this country. And we'd like to have you help us do it. And we are going to introduce you to some thought leaders, some visionaries. And today is no different. First of all, I want to welcome Yatish Nasi. Hello, Yatish. How are you? Hey, hey. Before we talk about good stuff, Gareth, I just wanted to make um, one comment about the makeup piece. I, I read a, um, I, I read a story once in China where a guy sued his wife um because their their first child was born and it came out looking nothing like he'd imagined and then he found out that his wife had actually had plastic surgery so he sued her for false for misrepresentation or false advertising or whatever you want to call it because uh, he expected a certain gene pool and got something completely different oh so my God. yeah there's worse than makeup i'm telling you, you, you there's a case for that i'm sure he successfully sued her as well because you never know like if you if it says on the box this is what you're getting, and then it's a different product, you, know, you can sue the manufacturers. So the Makes same would sense. go for people. And of course, you know it goes the other way, girls. Like if if we advertise to you that um, that we're a certain product, and then you don't get what you asked for, what you paid for, suppose you can also sue. So there's something to think about. Uh, Bakabantu and Simpiwe, we will see you guys uh, tomorrow. Very good. There we go. Uh, so, Yatish, another episode of This Is Us. Today, we have someone really interesting uh, joining us. Brian Green is the co-founder and the creative inspiration between, uh, b- behind Group 44 Properties in Johannesburg, which, of course, is the company that focused on urban renewal. This is a very sexy subject in South Africa, in the world, actually, at the moment. Urban renewal. We know there was a time where this, the Johannesburg CBD was just a no-go zone, especially for property companies. They wanted nothing to do with it. And there were a couple of brave and quite visionary people who saw a massive opportunity there. And what Group 44 have done is they've redeveloped vacant and derelict inner city high-rise and industrial areas. They've turned them into highly sought-after retail and commercial precincts. And Johannesburg is really just the tip of the iceberg. But Brian, it's great to have you on. How are you, sir? Thank you. I'm very well. Very good, Brian. First of all, um, you know, all I, all I can say from the, the point of view of someone who has always thought that the, the, the inner cities have a charm about them, there's something very kind of first world about the way you could live in these high rise apartments and have these beautiful views. And for many people, Johannesburg is not the first place that pops into mind. 
when you think those things. But you guys have been instrumental in developing so many incredible places in Joburg. And I've been to some of them. And I've seen these, uh, these you know, rooftop bars and these beautiful apartments and these incredible places that you've made. In the, you, you believe in the city. You believe in urban renewal, right? Well, I think it's, a, it's, you know, it's something that I got into by complete accident. Um, but as I got into it, you start kind of exploring um, the goods, the bads, and the uglies about these things. And, mm. you know, I learned that brownfield development in kind of normally in inner cities is very important to upgrade because otherwise it just turns into a bit of a hellhole and, you know, it fills with all kinds of nonsense. So it's very important to keep a city alive from its center and going outwards. And that doesn't mean urban creep. It just means keep the city vital from the core going outwards. And I fell into it by complete chance. And that was um, our first project, 44 Stanley Avenue. Beautiful. And 44 Stanley is one of those places I still love going to. So, Brian, I just want to quickly remind everybody, because your, your background is actually very, very interesting. I mean, you've got a great eye for identifying those elements which you need to retain and, and enhance, and then which elements you can get rid of. And that comes from probably your background in photography and, and working as a TV news cameraman, which was back in the days of the Bang Bang Club, famously in South Africa. And, and yeah. I mean, that's, that, that must, have, must have also given you an idea of what, you know, because people go, oh, the CBD is so dangerous. But in the things that you've done and the places you've been, you understood and experienced real danger. And you know what uh, exaggeration is, don't you? Yeah, I guess I do. Um, I think, you know, you hit on quite a, quite a, I always wonder where my love for dereliction comes from. And my mind always goes back to Vukova, which um, strangely now Europe's going through the second war in, uh, you know, in 30 years, 35 years. But Vukova was um, a beautiful uh, city on the, on the Croatian Serbian front lines. And mm -hmm. um, it was completely battered um, by, the, uh, by, the, by the Croats and the Serbs because the, Serb, the Croats were holding it, the Serbs were kind of bashing it. Mm -hmm. And I, visit, I visited it um, just after it had fallen and there were these beautiful, um, these beautiful avenues, these old buildings, but every single one had been kind of shot up and splintered and every window pane, every gutter, every tree smashed to pieces. And all I could think of was restoring it, restoring, oh, this could be wow. so beautiful. And I think that that dereliction um, kind of stuck in my mind. And the first real opportunity that came up, um, I kind of worked it until it happened, which was, again, 44 Stanley Avenue. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah Tish, I, I know you would be interested in this too. I mean, just before we even get into the, 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 the ups and downs of Johannesburg and kind of the inner city and, and what sort of opportunities it provides, just uh, your, your thoughts on what's going on now with uh, Ukraine and Russia, because that's on, that's on everyone's mind at the moment. Um, and, and having covered war zones, like you were just saying, in, in you know, Bosnia and, and, and uh, Croatia and Serbia all those years ago, uh, this must be kind of upsetting that we we keep making these dumb mistakes and we keep going backwards into uh, war situations when we thought we'd maybe left that behind? Was that naive? Um, I, I felt sick when I realized that they, I actually felt sick because um, it, when, when I woke up, when, when it was last week, when they kind of gone in, that the, the war had started essentially because, you know, everyone loses in a war. It's the most it's the most terrible kind of, um, it's the most terrible place where you see, and you hear these women and uh, women on, on radio or television and they are crying and they are completely beside themselves. And you see people sitting at the side of railway lines with their life's possessions. These people are like us. They've just come from their homes. I've seen it. They've just come from their homes. They 10 Ks walk away from where they live and they've got a few possessions because it's cold now and that's it and then they don't know where they're going what's going to happen to their house what's going to happen to their family etc etc and it's just a complete mess look we we pre-programmed we'll we will fight with each other forever but i just think that um there's some megalomania and stupidity by putin starting this thing 
And no, the terrible thing about war is that no one knows where it's going to end. There's no definitive answer. It's not, it's not going to be like done in a week. We're going to have the results and off we go. No, this is, this is a, this is a big irresponsible thing for the planet at the moment to get into a war. Um, and I don't know. I just, I really feel very kind of very bummed by the whole thing. It's terrible. Yeah. I, I knew you'd have some strong views on that. That's why I thought it was probably appropriate before we just move on to all the other stuff to just talk about that yeah. a little bit. Now, from being a TV journalist and producer to becoming a property developer seems like a bit of a big leap. Um, and you did explain just now how you, you know your, your experiences kind of put you in a position where you would seek that stuff out in some ways. But you also seem to like old buildings and, and turning things that that are that are pretty awful into into beautiful spaces i mean this is this is an interesting thing to do how did you discover in south africa that this is something you wanted to do in a place for example like 44 stanley all right so i used to drive past 44 stanley every day i used to have a camera rental business because i was a cameraman and i thought my days off i could rent out my camera so the business got it was a powerful little business um and uh, well, I say powerful, powerful for me. It paid me a decent salary and the people that I employed. And mm -hmm. I also started a, an editing company called Gasworks Post. And we worked around the corner. And um, I knew about the buildings um, to, d directly to the north of me, but never really did anything about them until my brother-in-law um, said he wanted to come to Johannesburg. He was moving to Johannesburg and he wanted to open a bar. Now, to cut a long story short, um, that bar became the color bar and it became a lot more famous than 44 stanley avenue when we started um but the the you know i saw these buildings and i said uh, um to the guy we wanted to rent this space and the guy said well i'm sorry it's an old mutual property it's not a core asset we're shutting it down we're mothballing it basically and we're going to de demolish it at some point and i said to him without having any money really i said I want to buy it. And I mean, like, oof, I went to the guy looked at me like I was completely fucking nuts. And I went, I went to, uh, I, I kind of went home and I thought about this. And um, I thought, okay, I'm going to cook up an idea. And the idea that I cooked up was that they, we agree on a price on the buildings. Then they give me the money to fix those buildings and they don't have to worry about anything. I will find tenants. And that's exactly what we did. And um, they sold us the buildings for, okay, believe this, 1.6 million rand. And they lent us money um, to fix the buildings or draw, we drew the money down as we needed it to fix the buildings once I found the tenants. So look, it's a little bit more technical than that because you, you actually had to have the lease assigned, but that's how it got going. And um, it was a, a, a fantastic start, which... And what I saw when, when I saw these buildings is I immediately, I walked over the threshold and I thought, okay, we'll start with a bar, but we need a restaurant, we need a shop, we need a this, we need a that. And we basically, I, I had this, this vision that it would be something like it is today. Um, it turned out, I think, more beautifully because you can't kind of imagine the nooks and crannies and trees and gardens and things. But um, I'm very, very happy with the way it's turned out. It's just a, a beautiful little, I, I think it's a bit of a jewel in Johannesburg. Yeah. It really is. And, and, I love, and exploring. I love, I love that place. I, I've, I've been there, you know, especially when I used to work at the SABC, it was like a little oasis in an otherwise quite drab part of town. And it's, it's put energy and life and excitement back into that part of, of Johannesburg. It's magnificent. Um, yeah, Tish, you've obviously been there a number of times, right? Uh, I do. I, I'm actually there more often than I care to admit, Brian, because I live I live around the corner. So um, we're often there for for chocolates and a coffee. Um, Good. One of the things, you know, and I think, you know, the value of space. I mean, so much has been written about the value of space, right? You know, kind of the broken window syndrome, um, and its its role in in social cohesion, which I guess is some of the stuff we talk about, right? How public and private can work together to to kind of um, uplift uplift society. And space plays a critical role. Architecture plays a critical role in, in really providing the infrastructure for people to interact, right? But I suppose one of the, the things that, that these sorts of developments often comes up against is, is you know, the, 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 the kind of 
label of of gentrification, right? The Highline Love experience it. that in New York, yeah. you know, and I'm sure a lot of that criticism exists exists here. I mean, what's your what's your take on that? How can we? I mean, it's a force for me, and 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 how do you leverage the force um, to still drive a broader agenda? Okay, so I love the question. I love the whole gentrification. Um, when people say the word gentrification, it's almost like, oh, we hate that word. I love yeah. that word. And and I'd love to gentrify a, um, a lot of areas and areas around where I work. But what the secret, I think, is, and this is where we jump to Victoria Yards, my latest development, is that you gentrify without displacement. So we were very lucky to, um, to find this property in a very poor area, um, surrounded by you know, a diaspora from Africa, um, where people's lives were surrounded with, with filth, with rubbish on the streets, with no, uh, no attention paid to it by the council, et cetera, et cetera. And we had the opportunity to transform quite a big space um, in this poor area that could employ people, attract entrepreneurs from the area that we could benefit from, but at the same time that they could benefit from by getting salaries, et cetera. So what we did, salaries and, and generating a you know, workflow or, or a business. So, um, and the idea behind that is that, first of all, people living around the buildings can walk to work. So they, and a lot of people in Victoria Yards actually live 60% of the people that w work in Victoria Yards live within a 15 minute walk from Victoria Yards. No transport costs, no waking up at hideous hours of the morning to get to work. It's kind of work up at a decent time, uh, mm -hmm. walk over to, to work in a secure area, make some money, go home, fix your toilet, fix your roof, carry on living where you're living because it's easy. It's not the struggle every day. And that, to me, is what, what I call gentrification without displacement. Perfect. Thank you very much. The kids can walk freely on the streets. Yeah, Look, you know, it, it hasn't happened yet, but it's happening. It's so weird that this gentrification has become like a swear word in development because I, I completely agree with everything you've just said, Brian. I, I, I'm so sick of, uh, you know, like people who think they know better and also who speak on behalf of poor people they've never spoken to. And they're like, well... I just think what you're doing is you're going in and you're ruining the character of this place by making it better. Like, what kind of insanity is that? I mean, look, for example, at, at places like the High Line in New York. Don't tell me that, that anyone would be walking down those streets. Uh, the way that they've brought life and commerce and excitement to that part of New York. A part of New York, which frankly, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was derelict. It was, it was all the things that we would think of the worst parts of inner cities. I don't understand where all of this comes from, but I don't think it's a good place. Well, it's, it's, you know, the High Line is a beautiful thing. We all love it. It's, uh, it's amazing. But what, unfortunately, what it did do, that's one of the gentrification projects. It made the, the properties around the High Line so valuable that there was huge pressure and there was a certain kind of gentrification going on with displacement. But, but I'm a, sorry. What a, what, a pleasure, what a pleasure for those people who've been living there up to then, and and if they that actually could afford to property. stay. Yeah, correct. But I mean, if they if they yeah. can't afford to stay, then you know that's also part of what happens in cities. It's always in motion. Sometimes a place that someone thought was, I mean, look at Hillbra back in the seventies. I mean, it was like the, yeah. you know, Hillbra used to be the the place to be back in the seventies in, in Johannesburg, and then yeah, it became yeah. something and completely different. Different. And the one benefit of the High Line, you know, which was great about that that development team and, and Brian, you probably know better than us, but they they sort of recognized that displacement challenge. And then I think open sourced a lot of their learnings for anybody else who was looking at um, inner city renewal projects to go, here's what we learned, here's what you can learn, and, and here's how we think it could be done better next time, which I thought was such a wonderful gesture. Um, and yeah. off the back of that point, you know, we... We've had a lot of guests on the show, um, guys like Ravonia Circle. We had um, the sort of education trust um, last week, and a lot of we've spoken a lot about sort of public-private partnerships as being quite a critical um, uh, sort of lever for us going forward. And so much, you know, I've seen projects. I know it didn't go ahead, but I've seen projects with the city of Toronto and Google, and that was that was quite a. That was quite a big, a big undertaking uh, where they engaged public and private. 
Um, we've seen so much on that sort of 20 minute walking city um, that's really started to, to arrive. Um, how have we, I suppose, I mean, have you had any exposure? Have you been engaged by anybody in, in public service? Is there any concerted effort to bring together sort of private um, kind of development uh, arms like yourself and, and sort of typical infrastructure and, and, and government work to try to create some of these landmark projects? Um, especially just to conclude that point, I read a piece the other day about the exodus from Johannesburg. You know, a lot of people moving down to Cape Town for a slightly better quality of life. You can now do things virtually, I guess, and we've experienced that in our own business, to be honest. Um, but, but what are your thoughts on, or, or, or what are your experiences on working with, with government to, to create some of these projects and, and, and hopefully, you know, rejuvenate some of these pockets? Do we have a functioning government? <laughs> I've, 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 just, I've just checked it. Uh, no. Anyway, no, no. Listen, that's I'm being facetious, but um, there are definitely. Look, uh, we get we get involved in, at very low levels. Uh, Victoria Yards, for instance, we've had the roadworks around us kind of sorted out. There, you know, there are there's a lot of interest, um, and they almost feel the responsibility of taking us on because we're doing good for the for the public, but. I do think that public-private um, uh, um, involvements are hugely important, and um, these, we need to put our heads together because there's so much opportunity in this country to make a huge difference yeah, but, um, with private-public. Yes, but you're a, you're a straight shooter too, and let's just be absolutely honest about this. Uh, a lot of the time, the the government, yeah. whether it's municipal, local council people yeah. or whatever they get in the way they don't actually help yeah i mean look i'm down in i'm down in the i'm actually in Burkhart in my little house where i'm kind of gentrifying right now but um <laughs> nice. nice but Good. um yeah but um you know i'm working on a massive new project in stellenbosch and we've met this incredible kind of i call him the good citizen of of stellenbosch his name is hannes van zeil and he's with the council in Stellenbosch, and he's a he's a very well known figure. And you know, we had a meeting with him the other day, and he was talking about um, putting together a, a, a quite a big project across the road from ours. And um, it's it would definitely have to be a a, a, a private public partnership. Um, it, there's absolutely no way it could work anyway. So I think it's kind of horses for courses. So in some areas, you're just not going to get it right. In some areas, you are depending on mm. on how progressive and efficient the the council or the that section of the government is there. Um, you know, obviously, you try it in. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there are places where it works and places where I'm glad that you gave kudos to uh, this Hannes von Sale guy. I mean, there you know there are unsung heroes and people who do have the best interests of their city, their community. Um, at heart, yeah. and, and I think that it's worth mentioning those people. I wanted to ask you, though, on a more general basis, what do you think mm. it is, having had the experiences that you've had, and and I would say that the success that you've had, not just the experiences, what do you think it is that makes a really good public space, and and how do we create spaces that work better? Because sometimes it doesn't have to do with money. Sometimes it doesn't have to do with location. Sometimes it's a combination of a whole bunch of factors. And you must have, in your, in your travels and in your experience in this business that you're in now, done a lot of analysis, even if it's just thinking about it on the way there and on the way back and speaking to people and kind of experiencing the place. What makes a really good location? What makes a really good venue? What makes an interesting public space? And, and how do some work and others don't? Okay, so I'm going to chuck us straight back into Victoria Yards again, where the, the, there were three pillars to create in Victoria Yards. Food security, artisanal workshops, because the very clever government took out vocational training skills from schools, and real and meaningful integration with um, the, the, the people that live in the area. So with those three things, so food security, there was food growing in an environment that um, people could see, they could see it's easy to grow vegetables instead of grass and roses. Mm. The second thing was an exposure to many um, people that lived in the area, different artisanal skill sets. So from glass blowing to working with copper to working with wood to, you know, creating art, sculpture, et cetera, et cetera. 
and then this and then this what can we or what can the the makers valley which is a partnership within victoria yards do to integrate in meaningful ways with the population so if you go back quickly to the 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 artisans and the makers one of the things that i did and 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 i curate the people coming into my developments is i say your product has has to be world standard it has to be able to be sold anywhere in the world because it's excellent so who does that attract that attracts the people the lanis from over the hill so the people yeah. from the north are coming over the hill to to buy stuff in victoria yards the people are coming to sell food to those people that are visiting victoria yards so you've got now you you mashing these people together without them even realizing it so you've got the 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 very um uh, you know the poor artisan or the or the you know the guy that doesn't have the cash to chuck around and the common factor with all of this i believe is dignity if you can bring people across the threshold that are good people they just good people and they clean people and they've got something to give you can match them up with anyone you want it's when the when the you know you you're not going to get the guys the pickers um kind of coming to to victoria yards because they just can't afford to but you you are going to get a whole bunch of different people coming together and not saying well i've got a lot of money you don't what are we so why are we sitting at the same table together there's this lovely pure kind of interest that comes from people generally they just like being together if you can create the environment where they all feel comfortable and i think that that's what we've done yeah, see, I mean, I, I, I love that thinking because it just you know, it, it connects so much with the, the guest we had last week who dealt with education, but the more you spoke to her, the more you realized she actually dealt with the factors around education, right? Community, community factors. And even just listening to you now on, on Victoria Yards and your approach, you know, the, the, the architecture is almost secondary, I hate to say that, to, but it sounds like it is, to the the sort of challenges you're solving at, at, at a local level, whether that's food security or, or, or sort of upskilling from a labor perspective. So, yeah, I think there's, um, that's, so, that's, and, and is that, is that what you're taking into Stellenbosch? Is that a similar approach? Cause I understand it's in, in Marcus Euster's old office, speaking of derelict buildings. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's a, it's a very big project. It's 170,000 um, square meters. Um, and it's, it's similar, but it's, it's, got a lot of uh, residential um which is another kind of factor um to to what victoria yard is because we don't really have um residential and it's not as socially aligned because um it's in a in quite a it's right as you enter stellenbosch um but there mm -hmm. was you've you kind of knocked me off my thread because uh, there was something very important that i wanted to mention but thanks you kind of knocked it off my out of my loop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean this this the Stellenbosch the Stellenbosch thing sounds amazing. But we were talking about communities and how the architecture is yeah. secondary and it might oh, have been. Oh, oh yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So you say the, the buildings and the architecture is secondary. Absolutely not. I believe everyone, without even acknowledging it, loves aesthetics. If you put it if you put somebody, okay, just picture this guy sitting on top of a rubbish dump sniffing rubber burning, or put him in a garden, where is he gonna feel better? Of course. Hello. So you yeah. have to bring aesthetics into everything. And it's a very interesting point because the Dr. Simon Mason, the guy that did his thesis on Victoria Yards, he was the guy that approached me to start Makers Valley. Um, and we took him in, we gave him 100 square meters and he built it into an organization that is well known now that raises lots of funds and gets integrated um, with, with the um, public. He was like, oh, aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not important. Let Full stomachs. I said it is very important because people really respond to a beautiful environment. And Absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, if, if I think about how many people during the last two and a half years with Corona and everything have suddenly become aware of their own surroundings in a very, very powerful way. I mean, for example, the fact that your house has for many people also become your office. The fact that for many people they were stuck at home, even if that isn't their office, even if they did have to, to leave and work, the, the fact that they were, they were perhaps confined to their house for a certain amount of that time made people suddenly mm. pay attention to things which architects are always paying attention to. You know, the, the, the layout, the, the amount of space, 
the use of that space, um, the the utility that that beautiful that that beautiful spot, the sweet spot you find between the aesthetics that you're talking about and the function. I think that mm. that's really the most, that's mm. the sexiest thing in the world. I mean, I'm a frustrated architect, and when mm. when, when we talk about these things, when you just mentioned it now, I get so excited about mm. the fact that people, no matter where they come from, what they have, what they don't have, what they do for a living, what they, what they sp speak, none of that stuff seems to matter. Everybody has some appreciation for beauty, for clean lines, for simplicity, for, for, for a space that is uh, warm and welcoming, as opposed to a space that is yeah. cold and industrial and no, ugly. Yeah, no, no question. And we need it. It's kind of, we need it. Subconsciously, we need to be surrounded by beauty. I learned a lot from my wife. She would not take an ugly fucking route anywhere. She would always kind of go the pretty route, the trees, whatever. And Magic. I've kind of started doing it. It's a, you know, it's a fantastic way to, to take life in. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're clouded with ugliness, then you've got, you, you're just kind of a bit a That's bit your messy, reality. You know? Yeah. yeah, that's your reality yeah. then. And, and, yeah. I mean, Stephen yeah. Fry. Stephen Fry says this thing about because someone once quizzed him about why do you use Apple products? They're not particularly useful. They're just beautiful. Um, and he said, <laughs> "No, you twit. Like beauty is the most useful thing you can get because if it's prettier, I use it more. And the more I use it, the more useful it is to me. So, so there's that. No, it's, it's so absolutely loose. vital. Man. Yeah." Well, we couldn't end it on a better note than that. And uh, Brian, it's so good to have you on. Uh, one of these days, we're going to have to go and delve back into your history with uh, with war zones and cameras and things. But for this morning, it was great to have your your input on these tremendously interesting subjects. And uh, I hope we'll see you again soon. Keep doing the good work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Tish, we'll see you next week for another episode of This Is Us. Stick around. Perfect. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.